Good morning. It is a beautiful day to be in the, the house of the Lord today. Even though we have uh, a storm somewhere, it's tracking us, as somebody put the other day, uh, waiting on this storm, we're being stalked by a turtle. Right, that turtle is persistent. We don't know exactly where that turtle's going, but we know who's the controller of the turtle. So we can continue to trust in him. We are uh, continue to pray for the storm. We will pray uh, for the Bahamas right now. They're going to be getting hit pretty hard. So we need to keep our brothers and sisters and those there in the Bahamas in our prayers also. As of now, we're still planning on having everything on Wednesday night. Okay? Unless this turtle slows down a little bit more should be past us by that point. If we don't have power, then we won't meet. But uh, as we're trusting the Lord, we're praying everything's going to go well, and we'll still be able to meet here Wednesday night. Um, Awana will begin. We'll have power hour. The youth will begin. Uh, I'm starting a new uh, series on uh, Wednesday night for power hour. We're going to be talking about the great truths of the Bible. And then Wednesday, we're going to be starting with the Word. Right, the truth of the Scripture, how the, how the Bible was put together, and all of that, how we can trust in the in the Word that God gave us. Now we are continuing in Elijah today. Last week uh, we talked about Elijah was still in the drought. He had a new journey to go on. The Lord dried up his his brook that he had planted him beside, had him to move on, and he sent him into the middle of. Alien territory, enemy territory. He sent him to a place that there was, it was godless. It was the center of Baal worship. It was where Jezebel was from. The country was not a godly country, but they sent him right into the midst of it. We saw a desperate situation of the widow and her son about to die. And then we saw the Lord and his miraculous provision, how he took care of them all. Today, and this was not by my planning, but it was the Lord's planning. The title of the message is Tragedy. We're going to look at the passage today, 1 Kings 17, beginning in verse 17. Elijah has learned a lot already. He's learned as he went to King Ahab. He learned to, uh, to do things that the Lord tells him to do. He was fed by the ravens and he was obedient and he continued to learn. But today we're going to see that he's got more to learn. As we do, the Lord is never done with us, right? You can never get to an age in your life where your heart is still beating, you're still breathing, and you say that the Lord is done with you, and that's not true. Not true. You may think that the Lord has finished using you in an advanced age, but that's not true either. You see, God is always going to use us. He's always going to grow us. All he needs is a willing vessel. That's all he needs. We've got to be willing. Sometimes we get old, we get cranky. We get stubborn. We get comfortable, right? We get in our easy chair of life and we don't want to be moved. And God kicks us out because he wants us to grow and continue to know his goodness and his grace. And he wants to continue to, to mold us into the image and the likeness of his son. Elijah's being purified. He's, he's, his faith is being built up. And today, the tragedy that we're going to see is one that is startling. It's, it doesn't make sense in a lot of ways, but we can understand that that's the truth of the way God works oftentimes. We don't understand it. Join me as we begin in the Word of God. 1 Kings, verse 17 of chapter 17. After this, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. His illness became very severe until no breath remained in him. She said to Elijah, man of God, what do we have in common? Have you come to remind me of my guilt and to kill my son? But Elijah said to her, give me your son. So he took him from her arms, brought him up to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and he said, my God, my Lord, God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow that I'm staying with by killing her son? Then he stretched himself out over the body three times. He cried out to the Lord and said, my, my Lord, God, please let this boy's life return to him. So the Lord listened to Elijah's voice and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Then Elijah took the boy 
brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. Elijah said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know you are a man of God and that the Lord's word from your mouth is true. Pretty amazing what's going on here. <clears throat> we see Elijah had been sent to Zarephath to be fed by this widow woman and her son. We know her son is young because he is not working to support his mother at this point. So he's a young boy. They had been to the point to where they were about to die. When Elijah got there, she had one handful of flour. She had just a little bit of oil. She was going to gather sticks, make the last loaf, <clears throat> and then the plan was she and her son were going to die. But the Lord changed things. Elijah said, make a cake for me. And then when you do that, the Lord God has said that you will not run out of flour and you will not run out of oil until rain falls upon the land again. And so now we get to the current situation. They have been living there. The Lord had been sustaining them. And they had been living every day, experiencing this miracle of the flour jar not running empty and the oil jar not running empty. And they're living with it every day, seeing God's miracle every day. And now, Tragedy strikes. Tragedy strikes. This, lung, this young boy becomes sick. And then he gets sicker and sicker and sicker until he finally dies. Mama was devastated. Man of God, she said, do we, what do we have in common? Have you come to remind me of my guilt and to kill my son? I mean, this tragedy strikes home. This boy that had been miraculously fed over the last months is now dead. Doesn't seem right, does it? I mean, this, this family that had been used of the Lord had been seeing the miraculous provision of the Lord every day, and now they experience this tragedy. It doesn't seem right, does it? We can live that, can't we? Some of you have already lived that. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem real. You've been in those moments in your life to where something hits, and it's like you're living a dream. You don't understand why it's happening to you or your family. You don't... You can't grasp it. You don't understand it, but you can understand the one that's got you in the middle of it. That's often how the Lord works. We don't understand his ways. He tells us that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. And he can be trusted in the midst of it. You see, these tragedies will strike regardless of, of how good we are, regardless of how close we're walking to the Lord or how, how we are being used of the Lord, understand these things will happen. And look at her reaction. She was broken. She was devastated. Her only son, she'd probably been looking forward to the fact that this young boy was going to grow up. She was relieved now that she wasn't going to have to die with her son. The Lord had provided the flour and the oil, and this man of God was staying with them. And now this young boy that she had loved so deeply and was the only thing she had left in the world was dead. She looks at the man of God, and the first thing she says here, have you come to remind me of my guilt? She feels like she's being punished for the things that she's done in her life. She feels that somehow this man of God had come and just kept them alive just long enough for the Lord to strike her. She begins to, to blame herself. Then she blames Elijah. What, did God bring you here so that you can kill my son? My guilt is overwhelming, she said, but now God is using you, the one that provided this miraculous provision for us, and now you're going to kill my son? You see, in the midst of tragedy, we often like to blame. We play the blame game, don't we? 
We want to blame ourselves, the things that we've done in the past. We want to blame other people for the things going on. We want to put it out there because it makes sense to us, doesn't it? It, it helps us to make sense of what is happening. Then if it's because of me, then I can take that. You know, my sins have, have, have come back to haunt me. Or maybe it's doing of somebody else. What we have to truly understand today is that it may not be any of the above. Yes, there are consequences for our sin. The tragedy that you experience may be due to some of your sin. We can't discount that. But you will know it. You'll know it. Because you'll know exactly the Lord will remind you of those things. But you see here, she had done nothing wrong. She had been obedient to the Lord. She had taken it and, and just given everything and said, Lord, it's yours. This woman that is in not even a place that worships God, she is the only one in Zarephath that even believes in God at this point. And so what does she do? What does she do? She has to trust. She has to trust. There are times that the Lord will purify us. There are times when the Lord will do things in us that we can't understand, but we have to understand that God, if he is our God, if we know him, then he is with us in the midst of it. He will bring us through it, and there will be something that comes out of that that is beautiful, that is powerful, that is strong. Our faith will increase. We will see that God can do the impossible. We will be able to trust in him more, and we will be able to see God's amazing hand in all of these situations. Dawson Trotman. Dawson Trotman was a man that began the Navigator's Ministry. He was a guy that believed wholeheartedly that we are to disciple, make disciples. And so he began, as he was leading his youth in the church, he was just a teenager himself. But he began to, to disciple kids and teaching kids how to disciple themselves. And then he joined the Navy. When he got into the Navy, he started to disciple one of his shipmates. And then another guy started to hear about what was happening. And he decided to disciple the guy that he discipled, discipled that guy. Before you know it, on, the, on that ship, there were 125 sailors studying the Bible, memorizing the Bible every day that were seeking the Lord daily. Amen. He got out of the Navy, started this ministry, the Navigators. At the age of 50, he was out on a, on a fun trip with his family. Lake in upstate New York. A girl was water skiing behind a boat and she fell and hit her head. Dawson Trotman dives in to save her. As he's bringing her to and everything ended up that both of them passed away that day. Both of them died. His wife, they had plans. I mean, they had all these things that the Lord they believed were going to do. And as Lila came to the shore... They kept saying, oh, Lila, he's gone. Dawson's gone. All she could do was quote Psalms 115.3, but our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Amen. You see, the Lord is the Lord. We can't question what he does. We can question and he will answer sometimes, but we have to trust him. It's where faith comes in. Whatever tragedy you will be dealing with, Understand that the Lord is with you in the midst of it, no matter what it is. The next thing we need to understand, the second point today, is dealing with the tragedy. This is a moment where Elijah has to do something. Now, as so far as we've looked at Elijah, Elijah's had it pretty easy so far. Okay, Elijah had a message from God. He went and delivered it to Ahab. And then he went and he lived out in the wilderness being fed by ravens. All he did was hang out. And then the Lord dried up the brook and he says, okay, you go over here and then I'm going to feed you over there too. All right. So Elijah has it pretty easy so far. 
But the Lord is still building it. But now we see he gets to the point to where he has to deal with the tragedy himself. He is not being fed by the Lord at this point. He is not having the Lord do this. The Lord says, now, Elijah, it's your turn to put all this faith to work that I have been building in you through all of the things that I have been putting you through. And so what does he do? Elijah said to her, give me your son. So he took him from her arms, brought him up to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. You see here that Elijah is, is getting after it. He sees that something needs to be done. Now, I find it interesting that this boy had been sick all of this time, and she had not asked him to pray for him before he got, before he died. Now, I want you to understand something, too. The life of Christ mirrors a lot of what happens in the Old Testament to show that he was the prophet and the Messiah and the king. You see, this parallels a lot of things that Jesus did. Right? You see, Jesus waited and waited until Lazarus was dead, and then he went to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he tells his disciples, it was so that you may believe the power of God. You see, he, he fed all of the thousands Jesus did, miraculously, just like the widow, her flour and her oil did not run out. Now we see Elijah this man of God has got to deal with this tragedy. Notice what he doesn't do. She's accusing him of killing her son. He doesn't sit back and defend himself. He doesn't say, well, you're wrong. I just came for the food. He doesn't say any of that. What does he do? He springs into action with compassion and with love, and he says, give me your boy. Now, Here's one of the greatest tests for the mom. Does she give him the boy? That was her act of faith and belief that God can do the impossible. Which was built on her through the miraculous providing of flour and oil. The Lord was adding to her faith. And now she had faith enough to give Elijah her young son to see what God can do. So Elijah takes the boy. He goes up and he lays him on his bed. And then Elijah does what he does best. He prays. When he goes to Ahab, he said, I've prayed, God's led me to pray, and it's not going to rain until I pray about it again. Elijah is a prayer. If he, had a, if he was a superhero, his superpower would be prayer. But let me remind you, as it tells us in James chapter 5, that Elijah was a man just like us. And so if you're a believer in Christ, you have the superpower of prayer also Amen. that you can depend on. You don't need the red phone directly to God. You've already got it. And it's by the red blood of Christ on the cross that we have access to the throne of God, where we can come boldly before the throne of God and, and seek the Lord. And so he does. He takes this boy and he puts him on his own bed. My Lord God, have you brought tragedy upon this widow I'm staying with by killing her son? He's saying, Lord, what have you done? Elijah wants the Lord to do something. And first he says, I can't believe this, God. You've been providing for us. And all of a sudden, boom, he's dead. His heart was broken too. He had grown to love this woman and her son. And then he lays himself over the boy three times, and he cries out to the Lord, My Lord God, please let this boy's life return to him. See, he is the picture of calmness in the midst of this tragedy. That's something we need to learn. He doesn't freak out and run around. He doesn't start, you know, sweating and worrying about all this. Well, what am I going to do for my next meal? Well, what if this, I mean, what if she kicks me out? And he doesn't start about the thinking about all the things that our flesh would think about. Right? He doesn't. He's calm. All right. He's dead. 
Let's do this. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord first. I think we need to learn that. I mean, how many times are we going to experience tragedy and all of the energy and all the stuff that we waste by freaking out and being anxious and worrying and all of these things that may not even happen in the future, all of this, and we can just rest in the Lord. You know, we've got a storm coming. Did you hear about that? <laughs> Let me ask you, how? How are you reacting? We have to have trust, right? As I've been praying about this, the Lord just, there's two things that we do is we, we prepare and we pray. We're not going to be stupid, right? And just not do anything. But we've got to prepare and we've got to pray. Right? But one thing that we're not supposed to do is just freak out, run around with our chicken with his head cut off and just having everybody have anxiety about this. Because we have a God that controls the winds. Amen. He knows everything. So why do we, if anybody needs to not worry, it's us. Right? We pray and we prepare. And we trust the Lord. Elijah, in the midst of this tragedy, prayed. He sought the Lord. There's a, a true story. 2008, little town of Mount Vernon, Texas. East Texas, it's east of where I pastored last. Mount Vernon in 2008, it's a little bitty town, less than 3,000 people. Most people were in church on a Sunday morning. 2008, a big city slicker moves into town and buys property downtown Main Street and opens up a nightclub. It just roiled the town. Everybody was up in arms. This guy nobody's ever known. He comes and moves into our town. We've never had a, a, a nightclub or a strip club or anything like that in this town. We can't believe it. And so what do they do? One of the churches in town decides that they are going to pray that the Lord would burn that down. <laughs> the church even had all-night prayer sessions that the Lord would burn this nightclub down. Seven months later, lightning struck the nightclub and burned it down. True story. So the owner of the nightclub heard what had been going on at the church. He, he heard that they were having prayer meetings to burn down his building. And so the man sued the church because they had prayed that his building, his nightclub, would burn down. The church got a lawyer to defend themselves, and said, no, it wasn't us. They actually go to the lawsuit. Look it up. Finally, the judge says this. He says, it's the opinion of this court that wherever the guilt may lie, the tavern keeper is the one who really believes in prayer, while the church members do not. Let me ask you today, do you really believe that prayer is sufficient in the midst of your tragedy? Do you really believe that when something tragic happens in your life, that prayer is the first option, it's the best option, it's the most powerful option, or do you wait till later to pray? That will tell you what you believe in the power of prayer and the goodness of our God. He will take care of you. How do you deal with the tragedy? You stay calm, you pray to the Lord, and you depend on Him. He will give you the steps to take every time. The last thing that we're going to see today is what happens next. Verse 22, so the Lord listened to Elijah's voice and the boy's life returned to him. And he lived, and Elijah took the boy, brought him down from the upper room into the house, gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, look, your son is alive. 
Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you're a man of God, and the Lord's word from your mouth is true. Elijah had enough faith to pray that the drought would happen, and it happened. Now understand something. There is not any place before this in the Bible where somebody has been brought back to life. Now, it's not, a, it's not a resurrection. If he were resurrected, he would still be alive today. He is a resuscitation. Nobody had ever been resuscitated in the scriptures before this. Elijah had been praying for something that had never happened. And look what the Lord did. The Lord listened to Elijah's voice. And the boy's life returned to him, and he lived I mean, just imagine, he walks up the steps with the dead boy in his arms, and he walks back down the steps with a miracle, follow him down. I mean, that's the God that we serve. Amen. Nothing is impossible for God. In the Gospels, Jesus is called to a town because a little girl has died. She's up in the room, she's dead. They bring Jesus the father and the parents are just, they're willing to, to discuss anything. So they bring Jesus to the house and Jesus walks in and, and all the people laugh at Jesus. What are you here for? She's already dead. Jesus looks at him and says, no, she's just sleeping. He goes upstairs and he tells her, young girl, get up. And she gets up and he brings her down the stairs walking with him. And he tells the parents, get her something to eat. Everybody was amazed because they had seen the power of God through this man, Jesus. Just like we see the power of God through this man, Elijah. Now understand, Elijah is not the one that brought this boy back to life. God is. If anybody tells you they have the power to heal you, wrong. God is the power to heal you. God is the one. He can still do it. He's not going to do it through a person because we would get puffed up. We would go on TV and start shows and ask you to send me money. <laughs> we would start selling you stuff on our show that we had prayed over it. We would be doing all this stuff to make our pockets full and not enhancing the kingdom of God. This is a miracle of God, and we see what God did here. God brought this boy back to life. Now look at the effects of this. Verse 24, then the woman said to Elijah, now I know you are a man of God. She called him a man of God earlier. But now she says, I know that you are a man of God. Understand, every miracle that has ever happened in the scripture points directly to the power of God. And it is to point us to faith in him. Okay? It is not to point us to any person, any ministry, anything. It is to point us directly to the one true God. And that's what we see happening here. This woman in the middle of enemy territory. Baal worship is everywhere. There is not a church. There is not a believer in the Lord except for her. And now we see through this miracle, her faith has even grown more than it was before. Understand, when you go through a tragedy, when you deal with the tragedy the way the Lord wants you to deal with the tragedy, it is not going to affect just you. It will affect people around you. They will look and see how you're dealing with this. They will wonder how you can be standing up under the pressure or under the grief. They will wonder how you can still have an outlook of, of, that the Lord is good. And you know, that will be the opportunity where you can go to them and tell them, guess what? Because God is awesome. God is the one getting me through this. God is the one that took care of my family then. He took care of my family now. And he will continue to take care of my family. And gives us opportunities to brag on God. You see, we never should keep these to ourselves. God has done things in your lives that only you can tell the story. But we have to remember, you have to tell the story. God doesn't want all of us to close our mouths and just appreciate him quietly. God does these things so that he can get the glory, so that we can tell the stories and other people can come to know the one true God. 
And then look what happens. In the Lord's word, she believed that now that you're a man of God and that the Lord's word from your mouth is true. She had faith that Elijah was actually giving her the words of God. Today, we can trust that this is the word of God given to us. This is how we know about Jesus. This is how we know about all of the things of the Lord from Genesis through Revelation. What's happened, what is happening in us now, and what will happen. We can be confident in the Lord and his word that he has given us and know that he will continue to take care of us. Overcoming tragedy is one of those things that happens over a period of time. But we know that we've overcome the tragedy when we begin to talk about it and to tell about God's movement in the midst of it. It may hurt at first. But we can be confident that the Lord is going to take that situation, that tragedy, and turn it so that we can be confident in him. Our faith is increased and we can tell everybody what God has done. See, a lot of us want to avoid tragedy, don't we? We want to just avoid it. We want to learn from somebody else's mistakes. We just want to read the Bible and learn from them. But you know, the problem is, we can read this and we can try to learn from other people's mistakes, but a lot of times we don't. Sometimes it takes the Lord hitting us with the two by four to get our attention, to get us to grow. Because our self-sufficiency, because everything we do is based upon us and our wants, our needs. I'm doing what I want. And God will have to take us to the point to where he takes us in the middle of the, the nowhere and he's going to dry up the brook and move us somewhere else in our life. He will put us on another path, another journey. He will do things in us that will squish the selfishness out of us. He will let tragedy happen to us to see not only that God is the only one to depend on, but he will take care of us. Amen. Amen. One of the greatest inventors that has ever lived was Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison invented the microphone, the, the phonograph record player, the incandescent light bulb. He's the one that invented batteries. He invented over a thousand other things. He was working on a storage battery, one where you could take energy, store it in a box, and then use it for later. He was way ahead of his time. He was a brilliant man. December of 1914, he had invested his, everything that he had had in this beautiful, beautiful facility in New Jersey. One night, there's a fire that starts. All the chemicals, everything that he had used to uh, to make the, the movies. He had actually started putting words to movies, and they had an area of the researching area that had, that had all of the movies and film and all of the things to prepare those. All of those chemicals ignited, started a fire. His son was 24 at the time. His son came running and looking for his dad. He knew because at that time Edison was 67 years old. Every, this was his entire life's work before him, and it was burning to the ground. And so his son, Charles, went looking for him, and he found him. He said, Dad, how you doing? What's going on? He said, have you seen your mother? He said, no, Dad. What's? He said, go get your mother. Bring her here. He said, because with everything in this lab, he said, she will never see another fire that looks like this. They sit there and talk for a while. Edison has a moment where he's really frank with his son. He said, you know, son, he said, there is great value in disaster. He said, all of our mistakes are burned up. He said, thank God that we can start anew. Within three weeks, Edison had produced the first fully functional phonograph. Three weeks after that. Understand today that some tragedies that you experience today may just be burning away some of the mistakes that you've made in your life. Some of the problems you go through may be because God is growing you and he wants you to look more like his son Jesus. 
Some of the problems and tragedies you go through may be your own fault. We are humans. We do not, as Christians, escape the effects of our sin. But we can understand in all of it that our God loves us and he cares for us. He will provide for us. He will get us through it, whatever it may be. And we can be confident in him. Today we know the truth that Christ, the very Son of God, Jesus, came to this world and took on flesh. He lived a life of a human, fully God, fully man. He began a ministry. He began to teach and to preach. And they crucified him because he told the truth. They put him on a cross, and as he was on the cross, the Father put the sins of man, all of them, past, present, and future, upon the Son of God. And he paid the price for all of our sins today. All of them. Everything we've ever done, he has paid for. They put him in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day he was resurrected back to life to prove that it wasn't just a good man that hung on the cross, it was the very Son of God. He was among the people for 40 days, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is interceding for us even this very moment. And he tells us, he said, if you will believe in me, if you will repent from your sin and put your faith in Jesus, the very Son of God, then you will be saved. You see, we have to be saved. If we choose to live without God, we will go to the place that we choose, which is hell. It is true. It is a real place. As much as I would love for that not to be true, but it is true. People always ask the question, how can God send anyone to hell? He doesn't. He gives us the choice to know the one true God. He knocks upon our heart. He draws us to him. It is us who choose and refuse God. Today I implore you that if you don't know the Lord, if you've not been saved and your sins washed away, that today you can depend upon the one true God. The one true God that loves you, he gave everything for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting, eternal, unending life in Christ. Today, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian yet, come and we will introduce you to him. Maybe you're a believer today and you're going through a tragedy. Well, I can offer you prayer. As we enter into the invitation, we'll have men here that we can pray with you. You're not supposed to go through a tragedy alone. That's why God made the church, so that we can be together. If you're outside of the church, if you're not involved in a church, if you don't have the brother and sisterhood of a church, you're an orphan. And God doesn't want orphans. He wants us to be family, and that's what he called us together to be. If you do not take advantage of this family of knuckleheads that will love you and pray for you, it is your own choice. But we want to be here for you because we believe that God does answer prayer. That he loves us even though we're unlovable at times. That he cares for us even when we don't care for him at times. So if you're going through a tragedy, if you need prayer, I invite you to come. If you know somebody going through prayer, bring them with you. Whatever you heard today, whatever the Lord has put upon your heart today, understand that that's for you. Your neighbor may have gotten something else from the message but God wants you to do something. Elijah said, give me the boy. And Elijah prayed, and that boy was brought back to life. But you see, he tells us things. He says, you need to do this, and then we're supposed to do that. Even during the invitation, while we're here together, God calls you to do something. I encourage you to do it. Delayed obedience is disobedience. During this invitation, as the, the praise team comes, do what the Lord would have you to do because he's doing this for you. Let's pray together. Father, we trust ourselves to you. 
We give you us, Lord. I, I know that there's probably some here that don't know you yet, Father, and I ask that you draw them to you even right now. Father, that they know that they are without you, that their sin would condemn them. Lord, that they have not been forgiven for their sin and they would, they would be responsible to account for it before you. Father, I pray that you draw their heart and that they will be saved today. Lord, I ask today that you will comfort those that are mourning. In the midst of the tragedy, Father, I pray that you make yourself known to them. That, Father, they can depend on you. That we ourselves are not dependable, but you are, Father. Lord, we put ourself in your hands for this storm. We ask, Lord, that you move it to the east. We ask for protection for our brothers and sisters in the Bahamas. Lord, watch over them and protect them, Father. Lord, help us in whatever tragedy we will experience to remember to seek you. To seek you. We thank you, Father. We give you this time of invitation for your glory. And we do this in the name of Jesus. Amen.